Mike Bledsoe here, CEO of the Shrug Collective. Today, we bring to you a new show, Feed Me, Fuel Me, hosted by Jeff Thornton and Michael Anders. As we're expanding what we offer, traveling to great guests, and introducing you to the best content, we have partnered with amazing companies that we believe in. We talk and hang out with the founders and owners of these businesses. Not all products are created equal, even if it looks like it on the surface. We've done the research and have been in the industry long enough to see what really works and what will make the biggest difference for you long term. With that being said, one of my favorite companies, Thrive Market, has a special offer for you. You get 60 bucks of free organic groceries plus free shipping and a 30-day trial. Thrivemarket.com slash feedme. This is how it works. Users will get 20 bucks off their first three orders of $49 or more plus free shipping. No code is necessary because the discount will be applied at checkout. Many of you will be going to the store this week anyway, so hit up Thrive Market today. Go to thrivemarket.com slash feedme. Enjoy the show. This is episode number 82 of the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast with our special guest, strength coach of the Houston Astros, Rachel Balkovic. Welcome to the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast. My name is Jeff Thornton, alongside my co-host, Michael Anders. Each week, we bring you an inspiring person or message related to our three pillars of success, manifestation, business, fitness, and nutrition. Our intent is to enrich, educate, and empower our audience to take action, control, and accountability for their decisions. Thank you for allowing us to join you on your journey now let's get started. What's good, crew? Welcome to episode 82 of the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast. Darius and Jeff coming at you with Rachel Balkovic, strength and condition coach for the Houston Astros and longtime friend of mine. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> if you know anything about the, where I've been in the past three months, then you know I'm doing fantastic. Where you been in the last three months? I've been looking at you for the last five years. You've been here, there, and oh, everywhere. Man. So the last three months, I've been a month in Europe, and then I went a month in Asia, and then a week in LA, a week in San Francisco, and now I'll be in Phoenix for a month. Nice. Good so boy. Some good places. What's good to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Still jet lagged, huh? No? <laughs> oh, man. It took me like five days to get over Asia, but, uh, but well good. worth it. It was good. How worth it? What, what part of Asia? I was in, so I was in Laos for two weeks okay. in like a small village um, just in the middle of the country, uh-huh. northern part. And then doing cleans with water jugs and shit. Dude, I, really? yeah, no, it was fr- that was like <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta see your social media. Okay, I'm like, oh, she's doing it. Okay, yeah, I'm telling you what, and for all the listeners, there are no gyms in Laos. So if you're going, for, be prepared to be weak when you come back. I'm telling, not even, I don't no think kidding. there's a single gym in the country of Laos. Really? But definitely, I, I mean, I, I fucked up because I went. I knew I was going to this small village and I did not bring like a TRX, some band, something. I didn't bring anything. <laughs> and there was like literally nothing to do. So I was just doing body weight the whole time. That's crazy. But I'm going to see this water jug workout. <laughs> I lost, <laughs> yeah, I lost 12 pounds. <laughs> That's not bad. I'm though. not kidding. Yes, it is. That's a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> I lost like 10% off all my lifts. Like I, I was, yeah. Did you get it back already? Eh, it's coming. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for everybody. So a little backstory on, on Rachel and I. We were in uh, the grad program uh, at uh, Arizona State uh, right after I got out of the Marine Corps. And um, I've since been told I was wrong, but I remember having a lot of conversation with you uh, regarding, because you were working your way into the PhD program, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, you know, you wanted to, do what you're doing now in strength and conditioning and professional baseball and all that good stuff. Um, and I remember just having some extended dialogue with you regarding the validity of a PhD with regards to your career progression in strength and conditioning. And, um, you know, as we were talking offline before the show, you know, not so much, it's not so much that the PhD wasn't going to do you any favors, but that program probably wasn't right for your career progression. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as uh, your your education and your progression in strength and conditioning, for everybody who doesn't know who you are, where you came from, and how you got there, can you walk us through that process? Man, I, it's so, you know, like, 
when I met you, I think it was 2013, I think. Yeah, so like second semester of grad school for me. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was like a pivotal moment in my life. So I'm going to like fly through a bunch of this and then I'm going to stop at that point and then I'm going to fly through again to where I'm, I'm at now. But um, so, okay, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, played softball in college, uh, went to Creighton University my freshman year, transferred, went to University of New Mexico. Hey. Finish up there. Holla. <laughs> 505, if anyone out there is listening. Everybody's a Everyone's Lobo. Everyone's a Lobo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She knows um, what's up. Yeah. I'm with it. No. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I finished there. And then my last semester, um, a professor of mine named Chris Frankel, who's now the director of human performance for TRX in San Francisco, he... Basically, I asked him where the best place to go do an internship was, and he said at the time was Athletes Performance, which now is now is Exos. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time was like the hot place where all the professional athletes went to train. It was very much um, not what it is now, where there's a performance training center on every corner. But at the time, right. it was like it was actually pretty rare, you know. So anyway, I went to Athletes Performance for an internship. Uh, roomed with a girl that was another intern who was a javelin thrower at LSU. I then visited Baton Rouge, um, was enchanted by LSU. Uh, long, long story short, I had a year I had to wait, but I did a graduate assistantship at LSU then for two years. And then after that, I worked for a company called Marucci Bats. I did an internship with Arizona State. I then did an internship with the St. Louis Cardinals. They had called LSU asking them to recommend somebody, and um, that kind of got my foot in the door with baseball. I did that internship with with the Cardinals. After that, I moved to the Dominican Republic. I did an internship for a winter ball team over there. And then I moved to Phoenix, which is where I met Michael. And I probably skipped over a couple of things there. But so Phoenix was interesting because I had I had done an internship in baseball. I had moved to the Dominican Republic. I did my graduate work at LSU. I was a college athlete. I, um, I was at Athletes Performance. I had this like great young resume as a young strength coach. And I moved to Phoenix. I thought I had a job lined up. That fell through. So I started waitressing. So that was good times. But I was like, hey, no problem. It's Phoenix. There's 15 baseball teams in Phoenix. I don't even know if you like remember this about when we first met Michael. Like, I, You probably don't. 2013 was a rough year. So anyway, um, I was like, OK, no problem. There's 15 baseball teams that are based out of Phoenix, which means there's a lot of baseball jobs in Phoenix. Right. Um, in strength and conditioning, there's at minimum 15 jobs that I could have gotten in the city sure. and also gone to school at the same time. Mm. And I was like, cool, no problem. I've got this great resume. I sent my resume. I think I applied to like eight or nine jobs and like literally did not hear back from anyone. And I was like, fuck. I was like, fuck. <laughs> I was like okay, this is like going to be a little harder than I thought. And I was like, well, shoot, like maybe I'm just not qualified. You know, and I was like, hmm, this is really weird. And I'm my, meanwhile, I'm waitressing. Finally, I get a call from an organization, and I went through an interview process with them. And I was like, I went through two interviews. They were like, you know, you're our girl. This is cool. We're going to get you signed up. Da, 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 da. Two weeks go by, nothing happens. And I'm like, what's the deal? Mm-hmm. Finally, this guy call, contacts me back, and he's like, hey, uh, uh, I really want to hire you, but, you know, we, I'm just not going to be able to make it happen because you're a girl. And I was like, Damn. Get the fuck out of here. That no was way. The, yes. that, that was the conversation? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, like, this guy, this guy, like, felt bad. There's no so EEO against that? He, of course there is. Uh. Come on now. You think people actually <laughs> follow EEO? Like, yeah. This is, <laughs> That's crazy. So, anyway, yeah, it's crazy that he actually said it. But I will, I'll tell you, I appreciate that a lot more mm. than me just sitting at home wondering. Because yeah. then, through the grapevine, like, four or five out of those other like eight or nine people that I applied for mm-hmm. um I like heard through the grapevine from a friend of mine in the organization or mm-hmm. whatever like oh yeah my boss got your resume but we can't hire a girl type of thing so but I was just sitting at home like do I suck like does this yeah, is this resume right. like everything I've done to this point I can't even get like a low-level internship position with a baseball club yeah, mm-hmm. and so Anyway, so he actually was like, I'm really sorry. What's happened over the past two weeks is that I've tried to reach out to other clubs on your behalf because we can't hire you and, mm, right. and like no one's willing to. Wow. And so, yeah. So I didn't, that, know, I didn't know you were doing all that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, so that was like my kickoff to 2013 because <laughs> that was like spring training. And then I was waitressing like going to pay my bills for school and everything. And I actually, the restaurant at which I was waitressing, which is a really good restaurant, um, the owner of that team that the guy called me was actually a regular at that restaurant. Oh, there you go. Mm. Just by chance. Sure. 
So like I didn't know the whole time. Like I nothing I had, happens by chance, by the way. Right by chance. <laughs> air, air quotes. Air, air quotes for any you know the listeners by chance. Um, right. So that was like I don't care what you think. God, Buddha, universe, whatever. That was like right in my face, sure. staring me right in the face every day. I was like, can I get you more water? Like, <laughs> fuck. Like, I'm gonna serving this guy is like a representation of my rejection. <laughs> anyway, so that happened, and I waitress for a better part of the year. I was going to start a PhD nutrition, taught the PhD, figured out that wasn't the route for me at the time. Um, got back into like strength and conditioning world. I interned for Arizona State for the second time for free, mm. if anyone's counting. <laughs> <laughs> so I got so I just needed to get my foot back in the door and they they were nice enough to let me come back and intern again. And then I started working at Lululemon selling yoga pants to people in Scottsdale. Mm. And then I finally got like kind of a foot back in professional baseball when I did an internship with the White Sox. And so if there's any like people who are getting into the field who are struggling with being broke or like doing crazy shit to keep your head above water or whatever. So at the time I was, let's see, I was working at Lululemon for like, I don't know, it was like $11 an hour. And then I was interning at Arizona State for free. And then I was interning um, for the Chicago White Sox who are in Glendale and Arizona State is in Tempe. So mm-hmm. you can imagine I was like, and then I was working in the quarter. Is that mm-hmm. what it's called? Yeah. The quarter. So I was like literally driving you probably. Got, you got no gas. Oh Good man. Lord. I was like driving everywhere. I was so, so broke. I, I was not getting paid at Arizona State, getting paid 11 bucks an hour with Lou. And then I was getting, I think it was $30 a day for the White Sox. And Ugh. so. Basically, I was broke AF, and I couldn't afford meat. That's crazy. That's when I was a vegetarian by by not my choice. By, cir- <laughs> by, by, circumstance. by circumstance. Now <laughs> I'm a vegetarian by choice, but then I wasn't by choice. Damn. So that was like by year Passion 2013. before paychecks. Yes. That's such a good like little tidbit. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> so, Lord. yeah. So at this point, uh, this is like, so I told you I was going to slow down in 2013, so I think yeah. it's like an important story to tell people um but yeah i was like so desperate by the time it came to apply job for actual jobs not like i was doing that little internship with the white Sox, which was very very minimum they were just like basically letting me come in and like clean the weight room (laughs) and like oversee things which was nothing um so anyway i i started applying again but i was like so anxious about the whole being a female and getting hard rejection that last year that i changed my name on my resume to ray I don't know if you know this. No. Michael. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like the whole time I knew you, I was like going through a t- real personal <laughs> struggle. So I changed my name to Ray on my resume and like made everything gender neutral. So sure. it was like NCAA, um, not softball catcher, but NCAA division one, like mm-hmm. catcher. Yeah. Right. So it was like, I, I just changed my name on everything and immediately got responses. Like, Get the fuck so out. fucking fast. I was like, what? And then, so that, like, immediately like that, I got two emails back mm-hmm. and then I got a phone call. And on, I've told the story before, but I answered the phone call. I didn't recognize the number and I was like, hello. And I was outside. I can't remember where I was. I was like outside somewhere, maybe with friends. And they're like, hey, this is so-and-so from this such-and-such organization. And I was like, uh, they were like, is this Ray? And I was like, uh, I was like, yeah, this is she. I was like, oh, my God. In my head, I'm like, it worked. Like, holy shit. I can't believe it. And there was like a massive shuffling of papers in the background. And he was like, uh. <laughs> and I was like, he was like, oh, sorry. I just wanted to make sure I had the right name. And I was like, I was like, yeah, you, there's only one way to say Ray. You have the right name. You just right. didn't know I was a girl. Yeah. Right. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so like it was a very awkward conversation, but I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. This isn't a good time. Can I can I call you back later today? Called him back later that day. Didn't answer. Send an email. Nothing. Uh, Never wow. brought me back. Never got to back again. So pretty quickly, though, after that, I just felt like, first of all, I felt kind of guilty because I was like, oh, shit, like that actually, I was like surprised it actually worked. And then second of all, I just realized, like, I, I even emailed those other two people back that had written me and said, you know, okay, we, thanks for applying. If you're interested, let's set up an interview type mm-hmm. of thing. And I emailed them back and they never emailed me back either. After Jeez. I wrote back and was like, I signed it, Rachel. Yeah. So once they found out I was a girl, mm-hmm. so 
And then I just felt <laughs> bad about I was like, okay, I just need to take the perspective of if they don't want to hire me because I'm a female, then I don't want to work for them anyway. Right. So mm-hmm. I just Absolutely. very quickly was like, this is stupid. I'm trying to like work for people that don't even have respect for me anyway. So sure. why am I working so hard to get an organization that seems like they're, you know, way behind the times? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I just like I gave up on that. Um, the Houston Astros came to the picture. Basically, there's a lot of people. So I'd worked for the Cardinals. Um, or sorry, Houston Astros. I'm skipping two years. This is still the slow 2013 talk. Okay. <laughs> so I'd interned for the Cardinals, um, not 2013, but in 2012 shortly, and I made an impression on them. And mm-hmm. then I was saying, do you remember my friend Katie? Blonde yes. girl? Yes, yes. Um, I'm going to tell her she made it on the podcast. So I was literally sitting. This was right after I changed my name, and I felt bad about myself. And I was, like, sitting her, at her apartment with a glass of wine in my hand. I was like, God, like, something's got to give. Like, what is it? What do I have to do? I've been, like, I have, like, five or six internships at this point. I had so little money in my bank account. And I was like, I am not giving this shit up. Like, something's got to give. I was sitting in her apartment. I got a call from the Major League Strength Coach for the Cardinals. Mm. And I was like, why is this guy calling me? <laughs> he was like, hey, I just want to know if you're interested in the coordinator position. And I was like, I was like, do you have the right number? Like, you know what, who you're talking to? <laughs> so long story short, interview with them, and I ended up getting the Meyer League Strength and Conditioning Coordinator position for the Cardinals. So that's another good lesson is, like, sometimes you think, you know, there's not a straight line from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you think you're, like, you know, and especially from the outside, you're kind of, like, gliding along in a straight, like, a flat line. You're mm-hmm. kind of, like, doing little jumps, like, off your flat line, and then all of a sudden it's just, like, through the roof. Like, something happens and you, you skyrocket. And so I went from not being able to get, like, a s- small – extremely low level internship that didn't even have a salary to mm. all of a sudden I'm in charge of overseeing 230 athletes and all of our affiliates for the St. Louis Cardinals who aren't doing too well right now. But at the time had been a pretty history organization with mm-hmm. being successful and getting to the playoffs. So anyway, that was 2013 rough times. So, <laughs> but great times, you know, yeah, both. So I went to the Cardinals. I was there for two years, and then the Astros um, picked me up, and I've been there for two years. This is going on my third season with them. There you go. Nice. So, yeah. Wow. That's a freaking journey. <laughs> That's not even like. Let me take a breath real quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said cliff. That is the cliff notes. There's there's more. I was Yeah, there's more to that. Wow, mm-hmm. that's incredible. Shit. Well, congratulations on the perseverance. Hell, yeah. yeah. Shit. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's. It, it's like looking back. This is just like anything else that. No, I wanted. It, it I, wanted adds to the I wanted. Story. I wanted to stop you at some a couple of times, but I was just like, no, I'm just gonna let. Just let it go. Like, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Ask question. No. Like, like yeah. question. No. the double dutch. Like, when it, was it time to jump in? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You well, I'll, that's I'm an done incredible now, story. So. No. That's amazing. Holy shit. Okay. So, like, so we were talking offline. Uh, about your your next progression, you know where where do you go from here? And uh, <laughs> how you re- applied to school every year for, <laughs> for the last five years? So, which yeah. I thought was absolutely hilarious based on our our previous dialogue so many years ago about <laughs> just education in general. But you brought up a very good point about uh, you know the the program that you get into uh, from here and how everybody outside of America looks at performance research. Um, and, you know, we'll just use Arizona State as an example since we were both in that program. Uh, a lot of the, the research coming out of there has to do with uh, um, people who aren't optimal performers, sedentary populations, people with sleep disorders, diabetics, and st- type 2 diabetics specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas, and that's where all the funding goes mm. versus... Uh, Australia is a huge one uh, of note in, you know, they pretty much throw money at performance research. And uh, we've actually had this dialogue with Joe Marsit over at Arizona State because mm-hmm. he's trying to change the consult- change the culture to the point that you have two degree tracks, legitimate degree tracks, one for fitness and conditioning and the other one for uh, a more clinical based track because mm. um, they're not the same at all. Mm-hmm. And um, but in uh, Australia, you know, or around the world. So a lot of these educational systems want to know what the high performers are doing well 
and scale it down to the masses versus the way we look at it in America in terms of what research is funded and trying to figure out what's making people sick and how to make them better when we all know mm -hmm. the, the answer is so obvious. We just do it backwards here. That's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> uh, I haven't like quite said it like that, but yeah, that's, um, I have these conversations a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can tell. So to answer your first question, which will help, I think talk about this, but the first question you asked was like the shift of progression. And mm -hmm. I think for me, the next step, and or 15 steps, which is really what it's going to take me, is being a general manager of a, of a baseball team. Mm -hmm. Extremely long-term vision is I, I want to I change the world through the game of baseball. And so there's like a huge part of me that's very philanthropic. And I think that uh, with what's going on in Latin America and how we're doing as a, as a business, as, um, as a whole, Major League Baseball, um, and helping our guys that are coming from Latin America, which is almost 50% of professional baseball, right. in case you didn't, you know, in case anyone out there doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're doing a little bit of a disservice to those guys. So I want to make some major strides there with education for those players, but also like education for our players who are, you know, who are in baseball. So right now we have a crop of, of guys who are, I call them the lost boys because they, they get drafted and play baseball for seven, eight years. If they have a degree, by the time they get done, they're completely outdated. They have no work experience. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a degree, um, they don't go back and finish usually. And so, yeah. like, we are, you know, we're doing a great job of, like, focusing on getting baseball better. But I would like to see more of baseball affecting the world and, you know, making the world a better place. Sure. Mm. So that's like, that's like the overall very, very like bird's eye view. But yeah. anyway, going back to like what you were just talking about is I, I've wanted to go back to school for like at least 30 years now, <laughs> 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 probably more like five. That was my, might have been an exaggeration, but I, I took a trip to Australia last year and um, I went to the ASCA conference there and the difference between the ASCA conference and the NSCA conference is basically like is ASCA. That, is that Australian Strength Conditioning yeah, Association? Yeah, sorry. It's, okay. Yep. Um, <coughs> so it's basically the Australian version of the NSCA. Mm, and sure. so the difference is, is that they're presenting completely like research. It's all, all their presentations are like numbers, research. This is what we did. This is what happened. These were the outcomes. This is the technology we used. This is how we measured it. There's this percent error. Like everything was so specific. And I was like, damn, like they're... There's no, there's no like, well, the athlete felt like this and our culture is this and da, 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 da. Mm. Now I think there's good p things to both. And I'm sure. a huge, <clears throat> huge mindset culture person. So that's like, that's numero uno for me, but I also realize the value of data. So I also on that trip got to visit the Australian Institute of Sport, which I don't know if you know what that is, but it's in Canberra and mm -hmm. it's actually kind of the birth of sports science is what I from understand. Okay. So I think in the early 70s i could be wrong but i think early 70s basically australia sucked at mm -hmm. olympics <laughs> okay <laughs> and so the government was like we're gonna change this shit so they basically poured like a ton of money into into the olympics and built the australian institute of sport which is basically the largest i i was so impressed i walked on onto their like facilities their, it's a campus really yeah. it's mm -hmm. like is it their otc the Olympic Training Center? Yeah, but it's like, yes. Okay. But I've seen ROTC and like a couple, and I was like, yeah. it's not even close. <laughs> like not even remotely close. Really? They've got, yes. They've got like 45 <laughs> sports physiologists on staff. They've got like a whole different, a whole team of, of sports psychologists, which is like 20 people. It's not like two or three. Right. It's like they, they have just, the resources they have there and the money. Mm -hmm. And as, as you mentioned, the money that's going towards research in actual like sport and not 12 year old sports, which mm -hmm. is important in its own right, but like they are doing research on the elite of the elite. Right. And mm -hmm. so I used to think when I was like an undergrad, I'd be like, why the hell are there so many articles on rugby and cricket? Like, who even plays <laughs> those sports? <laughs> is cricket even a sport? Everybody what is that? But America. Yeah. yeah. And so, mm -hmm. like, now it's all clicking, like, oh, this is why, because they're doing so much research in this area of the world. So I visited a few Olympic training sites there, visited a couple in New Zealand. Um, and even going to, I went to France. So I was in Paris, Brussels, and Amsterdam um, this year in Europe. And even there, I was like, okay. So it's very clear to me that my next step will be to go back to school. And my degree will be, um, depending on where I go, it's basically like 
biomechanics with a mix of da data analysis. Sure. And so, and I'll have an opportunity to also do a year of, of research in either degree. And so, mm. basically, my mindset is our world of professional sports, definitely, and also in college sports, you're seeing a huge push of data-driven decisions. Yep. Um, I'll just speak for professional baseball because I know it well. But, I mean, basically, if you're not looking at data in baseball, you are, I mean, there's there's not too many organizations that aren't anymore because mm -hmm. it's so far behind the times. Yeah. So a lot of the decisions that they're making are simply based on on data analysis models that like nerds are doing in offices somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like they're in the cloud, which I actually like love our nerds in our organization. So that's not a dig. That's like they're way way <coughs> fucking smarter than me. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I think the next step for me is to immerse myself in something that I've been missing, and I think. It's like I've recognized that in my repertoire, it's a huge hole and you have to be self-aware of those things. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, if you're not really in strength and conditioning in team sports, if you're ignoring it and you're saying like, oh, who cares about sports science and who cares about those numbers? You're going to be out of a job in 10 years. Right. Mm -hmm. Which if is that. coming quick, if yeah. that. Yeah. So a lot of people are going overseas to hire sports scientists because they have this background. And as we talked about offline, it's like, as you said, I mean, I can remember my my data collection was like the treadmill walking tests mm -hmm. for obese mm -hmm. people. Not like my our sports scientist for the Astros, Jose Fernandez, who's awesome. He came from Spain and he was like literally like in a lab making force plates for his undergrad. And I'm like, how different are our worlds? Yeah. So in their mind, they exercise science is literally sports performance. Sure. Not where I grew up as exercise science was like, like you talked about general population. Now yeah. I think there's 50 minutes a week of yeah, moderate like what? physical activity. Meds, you know, just like, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that applies to what we do. Now I think yeah. there's a lot more programs popping up in the U S mm -hmm. you know, that are like either a strength and conditioning specific, yeah. you know, um, degree, but definitely when I was going to school, those were few and far yeah. between. Well, it's really interesting because now at the, uh, national convention for the NSCA, uh, which was in October. Uh, that was the last one I was at. They actually have <coughs> uh, everybody, uh, a lot of undergraduates from those universities um, presenting their, their theses and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and then the list of universities here in America that offer that stuff, you know, aren't just, it used to be, the list used to be super short. Yes, like, ETSU. Like 20 and schools, then, yeah, maybe. And, uh, you know, of note would be Miami, USC, Alabama. Big schools with a shit ton of money. So they mm -hmm. can, so it's like, oh, you want to study that? Cool, here's some dough, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, now that list is like, I think it's over 50 schools. Yeah. And But the list uh, at the graduate level is still really small. Mm -hmm. So you can like get your foot in the door, and then, you know, walk the path that you've walked, you know, via internship after internship after internship, maybe a GA, you know, for the practical application of things. Mm -hmm. But the still the, the research pool at the graduate level and beyond is still extremely small. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to get ahead of that because it's, <coughs> it's like I feel like it's just starting. And mm -hmm. that's way again, way more schools than yeah. when I was going to my undergrad. Mm -hmm. But it's coming. Like yeah. the wave is coming, and if you're not, I mean, you know, if you're not staying ahead of it, then you're yeah. gonna be irrelevant pretty sure. soon. So, do you think that show, that sports science show, you know, the one I'm referencing that on, used to be on, on television, es on ESPN? Yeah, it's sports on ESPN science. now, but it was back in the day it was on Spike TV when okay. I was in college. That gave a lot of transparency into the industry. Like initially when I was in school, because I have a computer science background. Okay. And all those guys do data driven, like, like you said, hit plates or impact plates, whatever they call them. Yeah. And that sort of gave exposure to the industry. Do you feel like that sort of helped move that industry forward a little bit further where institutions are starting to implement that in their programming? Because you see now like Florida State, even the football teams, they they have their impact plates and their, yeah. you know, accelerometer programs and their, their shoulder pads. And it says, okay, this player's exerting X amount of energy. He needs to take them this many calories. He's running this fast, whatever. You know, do you see that, like, well, has that been a help in there at all? Um, are you re referencing the television show specifically? The, sp the show specifically? but I, I mean, no as idea. a No, you've never seen it? I I don't think I've owned a TV since I moved away from Phoenix. Yeah, that's I, not I, a mean, bad like, I, yeah, I don't even, like, I'm so far away from that. But I will say, in reference to what you just said about, and I don't I don't know what's going on at Florida State, and, and somebody out there is going to be mad that I said this, but um, I think... 
at this point, the U.S. is aware of sports science. We are starting to collect data, uh-huh. but we collectively, that doesn't mean that some school out there isn't doing a great job, mm-hmm. so hopefully I'm, you know, if you're out there doing a great job, good for you. But <laughs> we're, we're doing a, a really poor job of applying it. Mm, so sure. we're like, oh, look at all the technology we got. And then, like, recruits come in. They're like, yeah, we got uh, we got concussion stuff in the helmet. We got catapult to chalky running. And, mm. da, 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 and then we don't use it. Mm-hmm. Right. Where as, as, like, in research or as in science, you would use it because mm-hmm. you're actually using those numbers to get to a certain point. Sure. Mm-hmm. Whereas right now we're just collecting a shit ton of data and we don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Which is why, that's the whole reason why people are going overseas to get people who mm-hmm. have used this data and looked at this data their whole careers right? so that they can actually use the data we're, that we're collecting to make decisions. Nice. So Instead what's an example of, of like using the data, for instance? For example, um, so acute to chronic workload ratio is something that uh, I'm trying to think. Of, oh, Gabbett, Tim Gabbett, maybe mm-hmm. um, he's out of Australia, I think. And he's done a ton of research with this. So, Basically, acute to chronic workload ratio is it's the ratio of what you've done over the past, let's say, three days as compared to what you've done over the past month. Mm -hmm. And so if your ratio is at a certain point, like let's say that you um, over the past three days, you ran a thousand yards in the field, whereas over the past month, your average was only 400 yards. Mm. So that means that you are you're like done a ton of activity in the past three days compared to what you've done in the last month Mm -hmm. that puts you at a higher risk to injury. And so either, so that's on like the high end of things. And so from that perspective, we would go, all right, you've done a lot of work, which means that your body is taxed compared to what you've done in the past month. Mm -hmm. So we need to take your training load down. And that Mm. could mean for us, that would mean like either sitting out a game and like making sure that your body can recover because you just like jacked yourself up over the past three days. Mm -hmm. Or like in in other people's fields, it might literally just mean taking your training volume down and doing less less conditioning for the day. Interesting. And then like vice versa, if you're really, if you've been, if you've had a training load over the past two weeks, it's been, I'm just like totally making these numbers up for, for ease sake, but you've, you've ran a thousand yards every single day. And then all of a sudden over the past three days, you only ran a hundred yards. And so we would look at that and go, okay, in order to keep up your conditioning over the, like over the past three days, you've only ran a hundred yards in order to keep up your conditioning or to make sure that you're on pace with whatever you're doing. That would probably be more of like a soccer player or someone who runs a lot, but then we would take it back up and go, okay, we really need to ramp you up tomorrow because you've been at a really low training load compared to your chronic usage over Uh, the past two weeks. Interesting. Wow, that's That's one, yeah, that's one example. And I'm probably even butchering that. Did you get get all that? Yeah, I I mean, (laughs) I absorbed it, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Cute chronological. (laughs) And what what devices are used to to measure that, for for instance? Like, say say a pitcher compared to a catcher i guess is there, are they do they use different devices to measure that or th- no. is it the same well i mean i don't know i can only speak to what i know but mm. you would just use like so there's different ways to do it i guess but one of the most popular ways would be just like a gps unit and so oh, okay. the guy like i'm sure you've seen it in football is like yeah. i think we're early adopters more than anyone else but just they wear like a tank top looking thing mm-hmm. right and then they have a sensor that goes in that shirt and yeah. it, could, it tracks them around can see how fast they're they're running how many times they ran that fast um different they can even track like change of direction and stuff so you can track like mm. rotational movement um because it has a gyroscope in it and so you can track like yeah. it's like your phone like you know your your phone has gps but yeah. your phone also knows if you you know if i pick up my iphone off of the table it automatically lights up because it can tell that it's now facing a different direction right mm-hmm. So all those, the sensor encompasses all of that. And so it tracks, it actually tracks a shit ton of data. Yeah, that's interesting. Because that's exactly what I was seeing on the Florida State players, where it's like you said, yes. the plate essentially yep. in there. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, like, they had so many different measurements like you're talking about. It was, I understand the technology behind it, but as far as the data points that they're collecting, that was a little bit more interesting to me. And it's, yeah. yeah. I like that. I mean, when it comes to the research side of things, like you said, there's so much data accumulation. You really mm-hmm. have to ask a very specific question right. to sift through all that shit to find the answer, the appropriate answer to the question you're asking. Right. Otherwise, it's just you have all these numbers that, you know, in the context of how things are being done, you know, the law of averages here in America, mm-hmm. but 
you don't do anything because it's just mm -hmm. information overload. So yeah. th so they right. don't even they don't even know what question to ask because they because right. they're just staring at so much information. Right. You Which know? is and where sports scientists yeah. come in. And it's it's quite the process to take all that information, ask a very specific question, and then, you know. Okay, we're gonna look at this performance metric. Like parse the data after right, that. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, this performance metric, but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the question that we're asking. So let's look at this performance mm -hmm. metric. And you know, you kinda go through this test retest process over and over and over again. The mm -hmm. scientific yeah, process. The scientific yeah. Method, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh yeah. um, you know, over and over and over again until, you know, there you establish the the thing critical that's important. Point, yeah, the critical point of performance mm -hmm. to answer that question specifically. And that's a pain in the ass. And that's, <laughs> you know, but, you know, in America, but, you know, compared to how much we study the sick and sedentary in America, where there's so much history behind that, it's very easy to extrapolate data to answer a specific question. Mm -hmm. We don't look at performance research that way mm -hmm. here in mm -hmm. America. So that makes, so, you know, that makes that process that much longer. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Which is why they're outsourcing to mm -hmm. overseas to go, we need someone who has a solid background in this, who's already done this for a decade right. or more mm -hmm. to come over and help us look at this data and actually come from a, come from a data or a science background instead mm -hmm. of just like, <coughs> well, we worked hard today, everyone. <laughs> 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 fist bump, fist bump, see right. you tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And do you think you'll see pushback as you continue to like bridge that gap between the male and female within the sport or will it... Well, coming from a sport and science background, sort of be an easier path for you to get into these instit institutions like baseball, or we, will there still be like a wall to break against? Well, <laughs> oh, I mean, I think it's. Uh, I was telling Michael. I mean, I think I think that it gets harder as I go along. Mm -hmm. I thought it would get easier. I think it gets harder, and so the I don't want to say. I mean, yeah, sure, the higher I get or the further along in my career that I get, the more established I thought it would be easier and I'd be more accepted. But I think uh -huh. at times that even makes it um, harder. I think at first when I got in, it was like, oh, it's so good to have <laughs> a girl here and you're so mm. cute. The token girl. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And now they're like, wait, are you serious? Wait, did you you actually like want to do this for real? Yeah. So are you going to like be here for a while? That's like, so interesting, to... like that so, mindset. I don't know. I I could be just I think the real answer is I need I need to have time away like I, after my career's done or after I've left the space I can probably look back and reflect a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in it and I and I hear the things that are said about me to me whatever and I have this feeling of like you know there's like the scrutiny is high. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. So do I think that going back and getting another degree is going to make people respect me more, respect women more. The answer is no, mm. but I'm not doing it for that necessarily. I'm doing it, sure. you know, because I have a goal in mind and, and that's it. So if, if that happens, that's great, but <clears throat> not necessarily anticipating that. Mm. What, that. Uh, you know, GM or not in your mind's eye, what substantiates your success? Like what def what defines me as a human? Yeah, in in in, in your mind, what's you, what what defines what's what's a better way to ask that question? Um, Whether I make it to be a general manager or not, at the end of the day, I look back on my life and yeah, am I successful sure. or not? I think like I mean that's the easy answer is is how many people have I affected positively? Mm -hmm. And so the biggest rush that I get and the biggest like when I feel like successful, when I feel like I'm high and I'm just like vibing out of control mm -hmm. that's after i've spoken to a group of uh middle schoolers about really? yes mm. like of middle school girls uh, uh, speaking to them about you know being at the table and stepping up and um body image and loving themselves and really like you know that's when i feel the most alive to be Hell honest yeah. with you okay and so and also, you know, in, in my job, the past two years, I've been the Latin American Strength and Conditioning Coordinator for the Astros. And so that means that I work with our little babies that sign, and they <laughs> sign at age like 16. And, you know, a lot of them, I, I won't say a lot of them, but there's a, there's a solid handful that don't have great education, came mm -hmm. from a bad family life, don't even have a high school degree. The, the education they do have is like 
you know, freshman year education and that you, Lord knows what that knows in their community, wherever mm -hmm. that was. It's not like my private school education that I got. And so, you know, making sure that people are becoming better humans mm -hmm. is like my number one. Mm -hmm. And then if I become a general manager, that's just going to allow me to do that on a bigger scale. Sure. So that's, that's the end goal is to, okay. you know, I told you, I want to, I want to change the world through the game of baseball. So my end goal is not to be a general manager and like win the world series. Like that's, I don't even, sometimes I like donate people are like, Oh yeah. Astros are having a good year this year. I'm like, Oh, that's good. Are we? Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like I'm so out of touch with that. Cause it's, it's just focusing on human development yeah. and developing young men and mm -hmm. taking those opportunities when I have them to speak to young women. Yeah. And I, I started the virtual handshake Academy, um, for, to help young professionals and like, that that's what really gets me going. Explain so, explain the virtual handshake academy. I'm not aware of that. So the virtual handshake academy is um, it's basically a resource for anyone out there who's like deathly afraid of writing a cover letter mm. and doesn't know how to do it, doesn't want to do it, writes a shitty one, hands it in, like closes their eyes and presses send. Anyone out there who you know doesn't know where to start with that stuff. So it's basically your professional materials is what I call your virtual handshake uh -huh. because. Nowadays, it's pretty rare that you get an opportunity to walk in and shake someone's hand for real and mm -hmm. like hand them your resume. That never happens. And sometimes when it happens, they're like, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> Don't come in my office. <laughs> right. you know, it's kind of like, don't, you know, don't come in here. You can't just walk into a weight room have an in, a suit, yeah, yeah. in a suit and hand your resume to the head strength mm -hmm. coach. So they're going to be like, get the fuck out of here. Sure. So anyway, your virtual handshake is just how you present yourself online. And so the course is, um, it covers everything from writing the cover letter and the resume, which is like the big things, but also talking about how to write your res references, how to, con how to um, construct an email, mm -hmm. a professional email, if you're just cold emailing someone or even sending in your materials, um, just everything A to Z on, on that process because I sure as hell didn't know how to do it when I was getting in. Um, and it actually took me getting <sighs> somebody else's resume and being like, shit, this resume is so much better than mine. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. And so restructuring my whole resume mm -hmm. and then also like reading somebody else's cover letter and being like, God, I just got inspired by this cover letter. Yeah. And so I realized what was wrong with mine. And so it's it's really, sometimes it's not about the experience that you have, but if, if you're only an email to somebody, if you're only a, a resume on a screen, then how do you look? What is mm -hmm. what is your handshake? Is it is it a good handshake? Is it a dead fish? <laughs> is, it, you know, is it weird? Is it awkward? Is it the claw hand? You know? Right. So that's what that is. That's legit. I like that. Yeah. So it's just a it's a pretty inexpensive resource for basically what I would consider mainly um undergraduate students. How much does it cost? It's a hundred bucks. So I mentioned I've been broke. I've been broke many times, but I've been really broke a couple times and so I understand that process. So I try to keep it pretty mm -hmm economical for the young students out there that's what's up well, that's an investment i mean that's what coming out of school you don't realize that that hundred bucks can go a lot further than mm -hmm. you know the education that you didn't receive knowing how to write a check knowing how to in this case you know do your resume or cover letters that stuff they, they don't teach you that and you just don't come out yeah. having that skill set so i mean that's a huge investment for for the price i mean yeah. I'd, I'd buy that seriously that's huge. yeah i mean i just think it's like Probably one weekend at the bar if you're in a absolutely. <laughs> it's like for if you're if you say you don't have money for a hundred dollars to improve your resume, then you don't have money for a lot of your vodka, right. your vodka sodas either. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> so, you know, investing so, yeah. in yourself is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what that is. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. And working with the you know in the Latin American countries, Dominican Republic, correct? Yeah. How has the transition been? Like the the language barrier have oh. Working with those guys, do you know? Sp are you fluent in Spanish or anything? Yeah, I'm. I'm damn close. I'm nice. not like 100% fluent, but I can say everything I need to say. Okay. Um, but just understanding the language is still a little hard for me, especially uh -huh. in the Dominican. They use a ton of slang and they speak really quickly. Uh huh. Um, so that's still tough. But just basically, I mean, getting into baseball. You know what it was actually. My first day on the job as an intern for the Cardinals, 2012. I was like, you know, so excited. I came, I was fresh out of LSU. And if you don't know, LSU is the best school in the world, obviously. <laughs> no. Roll They're tide. Like, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, like it's a big time SEC school. Yeah. The, expect the expectations are high. The atmosphere was just like electric. Mm -hmm. And so 
I came out of that and I came straight into professional baseball and I was coming in hot and I was like, all right, ready. Like I'm ready to get I'm ready to go. They're on the line for stretch. And these guys are just looking at me. And I'm like, you know, I basically was taking through this dynamic warm up, mm -hmm. and they were just like zombies. Like they were barely <laughs> doing stuff right. They're barely. And I was, and I'm coaching the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's going on here? Like there's a language barrier. Mm -hmm. They can't understand a word I'm saying. And if they can, they're pretending like they can't, which also happens a lot. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's it. I'm learning Spanish. So these motherfuckers <laughs> don't have any excuse to not listen to me. So I was like, okay, basically you just think about it as a coach. We talk about this all the time. You're only as good as what you can, can communicate. So mm -hmm. if you have all this knowledge and you can't communicate mm -hmm. it, then <clears throat> what, good of a, what good of a coach are you? You're mm -hmm. not. Sure. But this is literally like if you cannot communicate, if you cannot speak their language, literally, right. then what good of a coach are you? You're not a good coach. Right. So... I think there's plenty of people in baseball who don't know Spanish and they've gotten away with it. But for me, it's been a vital, vital thing for me to not only communicate with the athletes, obviously, and develop relationships with them, but also it's opened up job opportunities for me. There's mm. no way I could have been the Latin American strength and conditioning coordinator for the Astros if I didn't have a base in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's been... It's almost like having another degree. Like to put that on your resume, I call that in the virtual handshake academy, I call that the mic drop moment for me is yeah. like, it's like, uh, that's at the top of my resume. Rachel Blockbeck, RCC, blah, 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 blah. Spanish speaking, done. Yeah, really. Mm. You, like you can't, that's just a, a vital, vital tool. So put your top for of the me, stack. Mm -hmm. yeah, for me, it wasn't even an option. Like when, when I was like, all right, this is a serious career move for me, mm -hmm. I was learning Spanish. That's mm. dope. How long did it take you to to learn it um i would say to be capable as a coach it took me just one summer it's not bad no because i was like constantly asking them questions right. i had my, my little notebook and just i was constantly making a fool of myself saying yeah. things wrong you know and then having them correct me which creates another bond because you become vulnerable mm -hmm. and you're you're messing up Spanish and struggling and I'm getting red and embarrassed and they mess up English because they're trying to learn English and uh -huh. so it creates that bond where it's like okay I'm gonna help you you help me type of thing sure um, and so that's like that it took me a very short amount of time because I mean it's just like anything else how are you gonna learn how to handstand walk well you do a million fucking handstands yeah. <laughs> and then one right. day it clicks yeah. so and, and w with the help of people around you so it's it's just like anything else if you want to learn it you can do it pretty quickly that's pretty cool man that's why I like to hear that because you hear a lot of people as they get older, they're like, I should have learned that one as a kid, you know, now it's Don't a lot tougher. Don't get me started. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. Did, did I tip, tip, tip it over? <laughs> All right, so this is, this is like kind of going on a tangent, but... Yeah, go ahead. I, uh, you're like, yeah, go ahead. This is what this is for. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start a podcast, and it's, I'm going to name it, I'm going to name it Plasticity, Plas Plasticity Podcast, yeah. because mm -hmm. it's like, that is such a myth, you mm -hmm. know, and if you read, if you, if you actually study a little bit of neurology, I mean, literally like science will tell you that your, your nerve endings and your nerves and your brain is constantly changing if you allow it to, and mm -hmm. if you want it to. Mm -hmm. And so learning something when you're young, I mean, yeah, probably it's easier to learn when you're young because you're in a structured environment and your job is to learn mm -hmm. you're literally your job is to go to school when you're very very young and so that's what you do all day long you're in a learning environment but at the same time when you're young everything is brand new right yeah so your neuroplasticity is at an all-time high you know? okay yes yeah because you're constantly changing yeah. but you don't lose the ability to change sure. you just it's just like you anything else not to. yeah yeah oh i'm 30 <laughs> so my metabolism my metabolism slowed down no, you're 30 and you're sedentary, and so that's you're why you're 30 and lazy. Yes. That's why your metabolism sucks. Uh, so many myths. But yeah, uh, but now, like I, I just turned 30 um, a few months ago, and I'm whoop, like, whoop, three. Oh, yeah. everything's downhill from here. Yeah, but it's like I, I talk about this all the time. The yeah, now I can be Need lazy. Plasticity yeah. out the fucking window. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there are surgical issues. You know, like that's different, but but like I'm broke I, as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but your your really the your ability to learn mm -hmm. is like in your belief that you can learn. Sure. Yeah. And so I mean I just I just remember thinking when I was I don't know, let's say twenty two, like oh thirty, like wow, it's so old. Better hurry up before I die at the age of thirty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what? And now I'm thirty sure. and I feel like I feel like I've got so much left in the tank. Like yeah. so much left to learn and I'm talking about going back to school and it's like no big deal. I'm not worried about well. But I'm 30, so yeah. my brain's slowing down. I'm like, yeah. that's a joke. Yeah. So where does your 
forever learning, forever student mentality come from? Because as you just said, and as we've experienced on this show over and over and over again, it's a choice. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but for a lot of us, that choice is a byproduct of exposure. You know, I know for me, it's been mentors and coaches and stuff like that who are always reading and always putting themselves in unc uncomfortable situations to facilitate the learning process. So where, yeah. where does that come from for you? Well, I would have to say, first and foremost, shout out to Bonnie and Jim Balkovec, my parents. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't know, like, and not necessarily, not that they're not learning, but not necessarily exactly that, but just like, just sickening work ethic just beat into me, mm. sometimes literally, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but most of the time, most of the time, not literally. Um, I don't think people today understand the value of a good ass whooping from time to time. <laughs> That's just a limitation on that one too. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they just really raised me to be forever seeking and, mm. and just relentless in, in my pursuit of, of whatever it was that I wanted. And so that's first and foremost. And then I would say, um, my mentor, Chris Frankel, I mentioned earlier, who's, who's the director of performance for TRX. He's like, every time I'm with him, which I was just with him last week, I just feel stupid. You mm. know? And, he, and like, you go to his house and he's, I think he's 55 ish, you know, and he's got like, articles spread out all over the table and like highlight i mean he's just a brain like he's so smart and so that's that's who my first ever mentor was and sure. so and like i didn't realize at the time how golden that was and how how smart he was but i was fortunate i don't use the word lucky a lot but fortunate that we crossed paths and that he gave me an opportunity to like be an apprentice under him so that's that's definitely one thing and i i won't i don't want to discredit also that like being being a woman in this field or being you know especially in professional baseball because there's none of one of us actually i think there's two i think the second ever professional baseball strength coach was just hired a woman just so you know there you so, go so two breaking us. down barriers so um <laughs> i mean it it pushes me you know like i hear a lot of shit being talked so i'm like it it does drive me i'd be lying if it's i said i it didn't mm -hmm. so that's that's part of it but the bottom line is, is like, I literally just want to be the best in the fucking world. And so there's really not, there's not a lot of options when yeah. you think about it, when, if it's truly what you want. Mm -hmm. So everyone says like, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. And I say, there's really only one best way to skin a cat. Sure. There's really only one fastest way, most efficient, cleanest way to skin a cat, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't really believe that there's a lot of paths to take if you, if you want to be, you know, changing the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's basically it i love that there is only one fastest most efficient way to do it that's i think that's 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 extremely critical from the the perspective with which you're pursuing your career um because like you said it eliminates all the bullshit options you know all the um uh the potential for shiny object syndrome and and chasing false opportunities and stuff like that mm -hmm. You know, if it's if it's not on your path, if it's not the cleanest, most efficient way to get you to where you want to go, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's a very fast and easy no, and you just keep it moving. Yeah, mm -hmm. which and is I, hard. The no. shiny object syndrome is real. For it's sure, like, it is so real. And yeah. it, but but you also said something that I thought was extremely important when it comes to coaching because I talk to the female coaches I have and mentor all the time with respect to. Uh, you know, the, the same dynamic that you experience in professional baseball, 60% um, of our membership is male. Mm. And they have to coach them through the same progressions and everything, teach them the same movements uh, that they do with the girls. And uh, one, one of the most immediate hurdles when coming into this industry for, for women, uh, in my experience, um, is the, the reluctance to coach because you can't, necessarily do or do as well um from a performance standpoint you know yeah like i.e uh you know uh caitlin's five four mm -hmm. 125 pounds yeah you know and i constantly ask her you know request of her demand of her you know when we're testing squats i was like get behind that dude and fucking spot him mm -hmm. you know and it's uh She's going to 
kick my ass for throwing her out on the, throwing <laughs> her the bus that way. But it's, it's, it only facilitates your credibility as a coach to step outside your comfort zone and do that which, which terrifies you. Yeah, that's something <coughs> for like was that a hu- was that huge for you, or is that something that you just accepted as fact and you know pushed through anyway, or did you have to go through that same kind of thing? That was never like in a different context. I mean, I always tell when girls reach out to me about mm-hmm. like stre- getting into strength and conditioning. Yeah, I tell them. I mean, I know this is probably someone out there is gonna get mad again, but it's like, sorry, you gotta be in good shape. Like you gotta lift heavy. Mm -hmm. You need to be conditioned. Like, you need to be doing the stuff that you're coaching. Right. If it's CrossFit, you need to be good at that. Now, you don't have to be a games athlete, and everyone is learning, so that's something different. But, like, look, I'm in shape. Like, I'm 30, and and I got a six-pack. So I know they're not stupid. They know I'm a girl, so Mm -hmm. they know I'm not going to out-squat them. Right. Even though some of them I can out-squat, which, (laughs) 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 okay, you know, but... That's neither here nor there. So I've like, seen you lift. You yeah, move. You move weight. You know, but but I'm, I'm not even. Not, I'm not even. And I'm not saying again. Like I'm not a world weightlifting champion. Mm-hmm. You right. know, I'm not. I'm not this elite level right. athlete. And I don't train like that. I don't train twice a day. So, sure. but you but, practice what you preach. Yeah, like 100 percent through and through. And I don't. I'm never ever will you see me eating anything bad in front of the players. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not gonna say I don't go home and have, <laughs> you know, whatever ice cream or something. Like I'm a human being. But overall, I'm practicing what I preach, and you gotta be in shape. There's there's no there's no excuse, and really there's no room as a mm-hmm. woman, especially, to not practice what you preach. Like yeah. I get out there and do conditioning with our players, and you know, I'm never gonna beat them in conditioning. Really, I mean, I don't, I can't even think of a time that I have. But they see me out there. They see me like I'm sprinting to the max, and I can recover in the same amount of time. Sure. And I'm not doubled over like they are, and right. so like I'm in shape. And so I think not only does it does it show them that I'm practicing what I preach? But it also gives me that confidence. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I don't care. I'm gonna coach you. I know how to squat. I can squat relatively, pretty good weight. It's, it's not your weight, but they understand that. I think right. they get it. Sure. And they think like they, they see it. You know, so, they see how I carry myself. They see what I do, mm-hmm. and it's, you so know. So that, that barrier that I'm referencing. Uh, in your estimation, would be more so a story that you're telling yourself versus actual fact. Everything is a story we're telling ourselves. Yeah. Everything in our life is a story that we've told ourselves. Mm-hmm. I'm too old to go back to school. I'm 30, so my metabolism slows down. I'm a girl, so I can't do this. I tell myself stories. Mm-hmm. You probably tell yourself stories. It's it's a matter of being aware. Yeah. So many people are so unaware of the, the bullshit limiting stories that they're telling themselves, and mm-hmm. that's where you get into a lot of trouble. Right. But if you can catch yourself and be like, wait, 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 that's not the truth. I'm just mm-hmm. making that shit up. Sure. You know, maybe that guy just had a bad day and doesn't want to talk to people. It's not because I'm a girl. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. And so if I, and I definitely used to do that and probably still at times do that where I'm like, hmm, is that because I'm a girl? You know? Uh-huh. Do it a lot less now. Mm-hmm. I really think if a guy's being disrespectful to me, most of the time, it's because he's disrespectful to everyone. Sure. <laughs> not because I'm a girl, <laughs> you know, like that if I ever have an asshole to me, yeah. he's an asshole to everybody. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it really is. It's not like it's I probably tell myself stories on the other end of things. I'm like, Psh, whatever. They don't care that I'm a girl. Like I'm so I'm like a, I've like told myself the story so many times. I'm like, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I think most of the time it's just if I have an issue with a guy, everyone has the same issue with that mm-hmm. guy. And so it's a sure. lot easier for me to be like, oh. Not because I'm a girl. It's just because this guy probably doesn't even want to be here. Right. So, right. yeah, I think no one can make you insecure. You make yourself insecure. No one can. No one can belittle you. Yeah. The, you know, like you belittle yourself. And so sure. when, especially like in, in that year 2013, when I was telling you that I was facing a lot of dis- discrimination, sometimes blatant, sometimes behind my back, but like most of the time. I was good about saying if someone didn't want to hire me, I was like, what's wrong with these people? Like, whatever. Why wouldn't you want to hire yeah, me? Yeah, I didn't say like, oh, no, I must be, you know, I must not be good enough or I'm not, you know, this. I was like, what's wrong with these people? God, mm-hmm. don't they know I'm fucking awesome? <laughs> 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 but but my point is to say that, you know, I, I've heard um, just, just a couple of people I've been talking to lately, and they're like, well, he... 
he belittled me or he did this. I'm like, he didn't do shit to you. You did that to yourself and sure. you're telling yourself this story. Mm -hmm. And it's really not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of whatever's going on with that person, whether they're insecure or they got something going on at home or whatever. Like mm -hmm. you can't let them impose their, their emotions and their beliefs onto you. Sure. You have your own beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. So my advice to anyone really, not just females, but if you're, if you feel like insecure about something, you better take a hard look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no one else is doing that to you. Yeah. Yeah. In the world of psychology, we call that progression or projection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're projecting <coughs> their beliefs onto you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, speaking of all of that, stories and shit like that, that, you know, you may or may not be telling yourself, um, you know, Michigan State's hu huge in the news right now with their misconduct and all that good stuff. Okay. Or bad stuff. I like I'm just detached from the world, so I catch you know me up. You know what I'm talking about? No, no idea. Oh, so uh, I'm detached from the world. I don't even okay. know either. Okay, so good. So Dr. Larry Nasser. Oh was, wait, the gymnastics yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. I'm with because you. of all the shit that he got into, mm -hmm. now they've implicated implicated the entire athletic department at Michigan State, yeah. namely the bad, the, you know, the money making programs, basketball and football. Right. Right. Mm. Not to say that you know, uh, wrestlers and everybody else, you know, all the other sports don't have dirt as well, but they've been, yeah. you know, very very. Uh, explicit in their implication of the football and basketball programs mm -hmm. um, yeah. did you experience or do you know of anybody that's experienced um you know misconduct or maltreatment of any kind just because they were a female in the ncaa oh i mean is it as okay, rampant like as the media would make it out to be I don't know about that. That whole situation to me is like mind boggling. I I don't know too much about it. Sure. It's like the amount of girls that have come forth mm -hmm. is just like mind boggling. Sure. Um, in college, I I can honestly say I, I didn't experience not one bit of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anyone that did. Sure. Now, I mean, now as far as like the physical mm -hmm. abuse and all that stuff, like, no, definitely not. You know, now in my career, for sure. I mean, it's. It's not daily, but it's like pretty often that I he, something said to me about me behind my back, this or that. It's, it's pretty, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty prevalent, I sure. would say. And it's not even like, it's not even about the Astros organization either, because I, I actually like love the Astros. Mm -hmm. And I know it's going to sound like I'm just shame, you know, just plugging them for no reason, but I really do appreciate the organization mm -hmm. I'm working for. But, it's like other, you know, other colleagues around the field or mm -hmm. other organizations. I hear this or that or, yeah. you know, the, I mean, I'm trying to think of something I can share with without like going into too much detail. But I mean, like so, as a s organization or a staff that I heard of that has a picture of me posted up on their thing, and, like from my social media, they mm -hmm. like make fun of me. And I just I mean, I don't know. It's it's like. I just made a post recently on Instagram about bullying. It's mm -hmm. like the bullying that you experience in sixth grade. It's the same stuff. Sure. You know, yeah. and so if you don't have a strong, um, if you don't know yourself and yeah. you don't have a strong foundation in yourself, then mm -hmm. you're screwed because yeah. that stuff's going to crush you. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I hear it all the time, mm -hmm. like very frequently. That's crazy. So speaking yeah. of social media, cause we were talking all offline about, uh, your social media presence. Mm -hmm. And its correlation with your career progression, how not many people in professional strength and conditioning fuck with social media. You know, mm. are, are you more in line with the what Andy Galpin is trying to do and push, you know, the information to the masses that's readily digestible to them via social media? You know, because you definitely as a strength and conditioning coach have a better social media presence than most so, but at the same time, you catch a lot of shit for having yeah. a social media presence. So, I originally started like doing this social media stuff, and I started a website in efforts to. Um, my, my social media is not directed at strength and conditioning information; it's directed okay. at women's empowerment. And sure. so, my <coughs> content is more about like mindset and mm -hmm. just like being a strong presence for young females and whether they're getting into strength and conditioning or not mm -hmm. and so and my website like that's what i want to you know be speaking on more and more and more is is to young women and so it really has nothing to do with pushing out information to sure. strength and conditioning professionals because 
I just don't want to. I mean, yeah. good, good for good for the people who do, but that's just not something that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's that's what mine was originally for and still is. It has sure. nothing to do really with like informing the masses on strength and conditioning. Yeah. Um, and I think because of that too, it's it's like I catch some flack for that because it's like, oh, is this okay? So she wants to start a business and she's not in. She's not really invested in her job and. Um, all of those comments that that I received, but I, I told you from the beginning, like the way that I will define success is how many people that I can positively impact, right. and that's what that started with. And you know, it's it's actually like shame on me because I let what I hear about it, I let what I hear about it affect, like oh, I don't want to post as much anymore, mm-hmm. I don't want to post this because people might think that I'm not, you know. I don't even know, but fill in the blank. People sure. might think whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I should just go full steam ahead because my passion in life is empowering people. And so yeah. if that's it, then, you know, that's what my social media is about. Mm-hmm. There so, you go. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of you. <laughs> oh. No, I mean, Thank you. I didn't know you had all that shit going on behind the scenes when we, <laughs> when we you know, when we were in class together. Uh, um, yeah. But no, that's 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 big that, you know, you allowed your your persistence and your passion to carry you through all that shit, the discrimination, the lack of income, you know, the the countless hours of doing shit for free, you know, to get you to where you're at now. So, I mean, all that stuff is an accumulation that turns into a launch pad, you know, and then all of a sudden you just, you know, from the outside looking in, you end up where you're at. And it's just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. let, me, let me tell you about yeah, all oh my the shit that it took to get here. You oh, know? my gosh. Yeah. Especially after I got hired as the Marley Courier for the Cardinals. I heard all kinds of things about, well, she didn't pay her dues and this and that because I went basically straight in their eyes. I went straight from being an intern Mm-hmm. Um, for the Cardinals, and then two years later, all of a sudden, I was hired as their minor league coordinator, overseeing a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and people are like, "Oh, yeah, she didn't <coughs> earn it," and I'm like, God, "You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you literally have no idea." Yeah. That is so there's no such thing as overnight success. Um, so yeah, that's ugh, couldn't be more true, for sure. Before we let you get out of here today, um, I want to ask you two questions. You can answer them oh, on, on any level: mental, physical, or spiritual, or you know, whatever. Uh, the first of which is, what do you do each and every day to feed yourself and kickstart your motivation and, and create that mindset to attack the day? And then the follow-on to that is, what do you do each and every day to fuel yourself so that you create and establish that carryover of momentum into the next day? Oh, man. Can I go on a tangent? Go. <laughs> <laughs> Proceed. Oh, just, yeah, like, I don't, I was talking on, I was talking to this girl named Emily Schramm. Do you know who that is? Mm-hmm. All right, so she's awesome, um, and we on on her podcast we were talking about routines and like I don't I just told you I've, I've been traveling for three months mm-hmm. I've been living out of two suitcases for three months, and and really my life doesn't get much better after that like I'm gonna be living one place for one month and then another place for six months and then I don't even know where I'm moving after that, and so I don't really have like routines every day type of thing, sure. and I know that it's like you know, the, the seven habits of successful people and mm. that people make their bed. I'm just telling you right now, I don't make my bed. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but what I do is like, I have like principle based routines. Like, so I, I do do these things at some point every day, but I don't, it's not like I wake up and then I have my toothbrush sitting right here. And then I have my, like, <laughs> usually I wake up and my shit's everywhere cause it's in suitcases and I'm like digging through stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, basically it's it, the two things that I'm going to stick to is I'm going to train every day and I'm going to eat healthy every day. And if I p- have those two things in place, my life seriously like falls into place at all times. And so no matter what, if I'm in an airport, if I'm jet lagged as a mother, if I'm, if I'm in the middle of nowhere in Laos and I, you know, like, I mean, talk about discomfort, like no, no running water, you know, no real toilets, squatting toilet, uh, the alphabet, it's Laos, like there's, I can't even make sense of anything, the alphabet's completely different, like language barrier was ridiculous, just, I was completely uncomfortable, which is why I went there, mm-hmm. but I just kept telling myself, like, all right, Rachel, today, all you're going to do is focus on getting in a training session, whatever that means, which was cleaning water jugs <laughs> and like just <laughs> running and push-ups and stuff. Get in a training session and make sure you're eating cleanly, which is not hard there because they serve like uh, insects and like mm-hmm. the cleanest food ever. <laughs> so, uh, but I was like, as soon as I like, I was able to keep those routines, that's, that's my thing. Sure. So what do I do every day to like 
feed myself is those two things have mm -hmm. to be in line. And a training session, by the way, does not have to be killing myself. It's sometimes it's body weight squats and whatever, or it's mm -hmm. a hike. Um, fueling, I would say, like to me, is is education. Mm -hmm. And so reading and podcasts. Sometimes I overconsume on that stuff, but um, I'm a huge podcast audiobook junkie so i'm like deep into um i'm deep into uh stealing fire right now if you know that's you, all it's in, it's it's in my queue you gotta <laughs> you gotta I, I downloaded it last month but i have like five books in front of it right now mm. yeah i mean i've got like 20 so i guess <laughs> I, I know what you're saying but anyway so i'm i'm deep into stealing fire so i've been reading that i got I'm a like, 20 hour flight to brazil on thursday so yes there I'm, you I'm go gonna push through a bunch of that stuff there you go yeah so yeah, I would say to fuel me is, is just education, mm. like just reading. I've got, I know they say you shouldn't do this, but it, I like it. So I've got like my bedtime book at night that's like, usually it's, so there's Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Have mm -hmm. you, you? Oh, yeah. Um, that's by my bedside, Tao Te Ching, which is just on Taoism, mm. uh, which is another good, it's kind of like, it's, I mean, it's basically similar to Meditations. Um, set it because I'm my list. So I've got like bedtime reading and then I've got like studying. So that's like my strength and conditioning. Like I just finished Therapeutic Neuroscience Education, which is a great book if you want to read about the science behind plasticity. Mm. Um, <laughs> and then I've also got like my audiobooks. So I'm mm. like, that's what lights me up and keeps mm -hmm. me going, I think. So that's what's up. Dope. And then where can everybody in this community go follow you and support you? Uh, social media websites anything you have going i would say i'm most active on um my instagram which is just rachel.balkovic and then how do you um, spell balkovic b as in boy a l k o v as in victory e c as in cat i've only done that a million times in my life. <laughs> 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 so that's that's my instagram and then um i'm on virtual handshake academy a little bit more too now and then i, ha I do have a website also which is just rachelbalkovic.com so you can pretty much find me easily cool yeah. Loved it. Loved it. Well, you're rocking it. You know. Keep crushing it, though. Appreciate watching your journey. You know, now that I know so much more about what was going on, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> as, as we yeah. were becoming friends and everything. Um, no, much, much love and success. And, you know, for everybody listening uh, today, you know, get out there and support uh, the virtual handshake. Uh, educate yourselves on, you know, being a consummate professional before you walk in the room um, and support everything that Rachel has going on. She's doing big things and she's going to change the world. We're looking forward to watching yeah. you do it. Right. So thanks, guys. Yeah. Until Thank next you. time. Feed me, fuel me. And that'll do it for this week's episode with our special guest, Rachel Balkovic. If you want to check out everything that Rachel has going and support her, please go to the full show notes on feedmefuelme.com. Also, be sure to connect with us on social media, including Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter at FeedMeFuelMe. We would love to hear from each and every one of you. If you found this episode inspiring in any way, please leave a rating and a comment on iTunes so we can continue on this journey together. We really appreciate you all for spending time with us today and allowing us to join you on your journey. We would love to hear your feedback on this episode, as well as guests and topics for future episodes. To end this episode, we would love to leave you with a quote by Fabian Fredrickson. The things you are passionate about are not random. They are your calling. Thank you again for joining us, and we will catch you on the next episode. Way to make it to the end of the show. As always, go to Shrug Collect over at iTunes. Give us a five-star review, positive comment, and hit thrivemarket.com slash feedme to get that great deal on awesome groceries. See you next time.